Good evening and welcome. I'm Ralston King, counselor for the Rita Rockcliffe Ward of the City of Ottawa, and more recently trustee of the Ottawa Public Library Board. I'm delighted to be introducing this evening's program on behalf of OPL. First, it's important to acknowledge that the land where, we, where most of us are gathered this evening is the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. Ottawa Public Library is delighted to be partnering with the Ottawa International Writers Festival to offer a stirring opportunity to reflect on Black history and the many contributions of Black Canadians to our country and communities. The library strives to build community through varied programming and to foster change, inclusiveness, and learning. Visit the OPL website to find out about other exciting activities for Black History Month. This evening, we are pleased to have with us Ronaldo Walcott, who will discuss his recent book, On Property. This book, in this book, Ronaldo Walcott explores the long shadow cast by slavery's afterlife. On Property shows how present day abolitionists continue the work of their forebearers to arrive at an imaginative creative philosophy that ensures freedom and equity for all. I hope this conversation will enrich your thinking and perhaps inspire you to take up paths for change. On Property is currently available at OPL. It is my pleasure now to hand over the podium to Sean Wilson from the Ottawa International Writers Festival to introduce the moderator and author. Thank you and have an excellent evening. Thank you, Trustee King. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe and to the first event of the Writers Festival's 2021 virtual season. We'll be holding events most Mondays between tonight and early June, all in partnership with the Ottawa Public Library and all presented free of charge. This Thursday, we're thrilled to be presenting Can You Hear Me Now? with Selena Cesar Chavanez, hosted by CBC's Adrian Harewood. And in the weeks ahead, we'll be spending time with Kehende Andrews, Koa Beck, Eden Robinson, Andre Picard, Daryl McLeod, Thomas King, and Seth Klein, among others. So there's lots to look forward to. Plus, our podcast, Writers Festival Radio, returns Friday at noon for season two. Friday, we'll hear from Ashley Audrain and Amanda Duke. Just like last fall, everything will be available on demand at writersfestival.org. So all you need to do to connect with some of the world's most acclaimed authors and thinkers is visit us online and press play. I wanna thank you in advance for supporting authors and booksellers through these difficult times. Our official bookseller is Perfect Books on Elgin Street. And I know that wherever you are right now, there's an independent bookseller nearby who would be more than happy to sell you 15 to 20 copies of On Property. Please consider making a donation to support our virtual programming as it may be a long while before we're able to gather again in person. Your financial support will allow us to continue to bring you the world's most interesting authors and thinkers. I want to thank the Government of Canada, the Government of Ontario, the City of Ottawa, the Ontario Arts Council, the Canada Council for the Arts, Carleton University, and CBC Ottawa for their ongoing support. Now, let's turn it over to our host, CBC's Ithil Musa, who will introduce us to tonight's guest of honour, Ronaldo Walcott. Thank you so much, Sean. It is an honour today to welcome Ronaldo Walcott. He is a professor in the Women and Gender Studies Institute at the University of Toronto. His research is in the area of Black diaspora, cultural studies, gender, and sexuality. His pam pamphlet on property examines the relationship between policing and property. And Walcott makes an argument, an ethical and moral case for the abolition of both as well as incarceration. I'd like to welcome Ronaldo. Hello, Ronaldo. Hello, Ethel. Thank you for that lovely introduction. And I'd also like to thank the Ottawa Writers Fest and the Ottawa Public Library for inviting me to be in conversation with you. Thank you. You know, Ronaldo, before we delve into the content of On Property, can you please tell us a little bit about the history of pamphlets and how you came to write this one? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, you know, I come to understand the history of pamphletarian and pamphlets through the first abolition movement, which is the abolition movement to end the traffic, the trade in African bodies and flesh and plantation slavery um, in the Americas, but also slavery in cities and towns where there were not plantations in the Americas. And uh, you know, as a child, one of the things that I would do is I would spend time going to um, 
the library in Bridgetown Barbados where I was born on Saturday afternoons with my mom. And one of the things that I did a lot in that library was I read a lot about um, figures like Granville Chart and Will William Wilberforce, um, some of the early white English abolitionists. And in all of those histories that I would read, there would always be um, this discussion of how one of the ways in which they were able to get their arguments out and get information out about the um, slave trade and, and plantation slavery was through the news of pamphlets. Pamphletarian was like central to getting the information out. Now, of course, pamphletarian has a, a, an even an other history as well, a history of this, that's news to bring white working class people into political organization um, and so on. But for me, in, in terms of black, black people and black histories, um, the pamphlet is a really important symbol of galvanizing debate, sharing information and inviting people into conversation. And this particular pamphlet is part of a series um, published by Biblioasis. Um, and my, my book is the second in that series. And the first book is called On Race, and it's by philosopher Mark Kingwell. And my book is the second, and it came about because um, um, Dan Walsh heard me in a conversation with Matt Galloway on CBC Radio. And towards the end of the conversation, I, I said something to the effect of, well, if you're actually going to seriously deal with the questions of police brutality and violence, we're going to have to at some point reckon with the abolition of property. Um, so when Dan asked me to, to, if I would consider doing this, I said yes right away, because what he didn't know is that from my childhood, I'd always secretly wanted to write a pamphlet, that I wanted to engage in, you know, the kind of propaganda wars that a pamphlet stands for, but also that pamphlets are supposed to be persuasive and supposed to launch launch uh, an arrow into, into the public sphere and open up some debate about important and pressing issues. I'm glad you mentioned about uh, being approached because it, it leads into my next question, which is, you know, you, you write about how you were, you were excited about the, the fact that you were going to be able to write this pamphlet. And it came at a, it seems like at the right time. Tell me a little bit about that and why the topic of property um, was perfect for for this endeavor. Mm -hmm. Well, as you as you know and, and as you would recall, last March, April, and May, across North America, many of us had taken to isolation in our homes. Those of us who had homes, uh, and as we sat in isolation. Um, living in the early weeks and months of the pandemic, one of the things that many people saw um, was an 11, eight to 11 minute video of George Floyd having the life need out of him by a police officer. And he was allegedly experiencing and died at the hands of that officer, died at the knee of that officer because he allegedly um, passed a fake $20 bill. And of course, um, people seeing that evidence took to the streets in great numbers. And it appeared for a brief moment like North America could tilt into something else. And that excited me quite a bit. Um, it was really exciting to hear people, um, so many to see so many people on the street um, calling for defunding the police and so on. And it and it it really galvanized in me the idea that it, that it's not just defund the police that we what we want and we need, we need to abolish the police, but we also need to go much further than that. So when I think about the fact that, you know, a black man, um, yet again, yet another black man died asking for his breath, saying he can't breathe, asking for his mother, um, for allegedly passing $20 bill, um, a fake $20 bill. You know, all of the issues that um, converge on what it means to be Black in North America, to be Black in the Americas, really resonated in that one image, in that eight to 11 minutes of, of terrifying violence. 
you, you argue essentially that the black people truly aren't free. Uh, you know, we're stopped, we're surveilled, we're questioned, we're has harassed simply for just being, you know, taking up space. Uh, you mentioned the, the instance, uh, obviously, of Amy Cooper that people will, will remember um, about calling the cops on a black man who asked her to, um, to leash her dog in Central Park uh, in an area where there were bird watchers. Um, you write, black people will not fully be able to breathe until property is abolished. My question is, how is property and black liberation interconnected? Yeah, well, I began by telling you that, um, you know, I, as a child, I read all these histories about the abolitionist movement. Now, you know, black people enter the Americas as the property of someone else, you know, and, and so property is the law and the law is property as far as black people, black bodies, black flesh is concerned. And that particular history has not left us, even though we talk about black people being emancipated. Um, and the history of what constitutes contemporary law is founded in that profound exception that black people are both property and the law because the, in the sense that the law is always news against black people to make us an exception to whatever it is that it seeks to circumscribe. So when I say that we can't think about black people's freedom without thinking about the abolition of property, I'm also thinking about what it will mean for black people to fully own their bodies again. And we see that black people can't fully own their bodies in our contemporary culture just by walking down the street you know, we're still asked where are we going, where are we headed, where are we coming from. Um, we see that um, Black people can't own their bodies if we go back to that horrific image of George Floyd um, being killed for allegedly a fake $20 bill. That tells you something about what infuses the culture that we live in. And it tells you something about the manner in which Black people as living organisms are responded to in the culture that we supposedly share. You know, Ronaldo, many people, including Black people, uh, strive to own property, you know, to gain a sense of financial stability, to, to create a home, to live in safety. What, in your opinion, is the alternative? Mm -hmm. So I think that when, when people hear the idea of abolishing property, I think what has happened is that people imagine that you're thinking that you want to take away um, the things that give them joy and pleasure and so on. But what what abolition and abolition of property and abolition and abolition for philosophy is really about is about coming up and thinking about other ways of organizing what is meaningful in life. So. If we begin with the assumption and the understanding that housing is an essential right for any for, 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 for the species, then the question of owning a house becomes a mute question uh, because everyone should have access to housing. And, and so, but what we have now is an order of understanding what it means to be human, where owning something is ranked as being of a better order than not owning something and not having something altogether. And so again, you know, when we think about black people, when we think about black people's history in the Americas, you know, of people who once were themselves property, this becomes a really fundamental problem for how we can think about societal transformation. So even though, you know, black people across the Americas have been free for a little less than so so-called free for a little less than 200 years or so, it's striking to see how that emancipation continues to replicate so many of the aspects of when Black people were unfree, of when Black people were not emancipated. So earlier you, you mentioned um, Amy Cooper. What did Amy Cooper do? Amy Cooper called on the history of the brutish Black man um, without having to use those words. But she called on that history 
by making the claim that this man was attacking her and her dog. And she called on the authorities, in this case, the police. But you can read those kinds of practices as having a continuous relationship all the way back to the plantation, all the way back to transatlantic slavery, all the way back to slavery in cities and towns. So, you know, part of what I'm arguing then is that property is not just about owning things. Property structures are social relationships. It structures our cultural practices and it structures how we engage with each other. And if we are to transform how we engage with each other, then we're gonna to have to transform how we understand what property is, what it means, and how it structures relationships. Right. You know, the idea of abolishing property, we're gonna talk a little bit later about police and prisons because that's obviously a, a big part of it. Um, to some, abolishing property seems completely unrealistic or, or idealistic. But you write that imagination is central to thinking about other possibilities. Tell me, talk to me a little bit about that. Okay. So again, I think that, you know, this is about um, recognizing that how we live together right now, um, it's not inherent, it's not organic, that it was made. We, we made. we made our social relations, we made the institutions that shape how we relate with each other. We made the institutions that produce what we call culture and that frame how we move through the world. And it took, in this instance that I'm arguing, it took about 500 years, a little bit more for us to arrive at where we're at in 2021. But people imagined those things. They imagined um, what it would mean to craft laws that allowed individuals to amass tremendous wealth. People imagined um, processes of education that would indoctrinate and tutelage people into understanding that individuals amassing tremendous amount of wealth is a legitimate way of being. And what, the, what, the, what I'm arguing about questions of the imagination is that we can imagine something different from that. That we can imagine a world in which individuals amassing wealth is not seen as um, the, the highest moment of what it means to be human. We can reimagine a world where um, care for people who you share nothing in common with is the basis of the ethics from which you proceed. We can imagine a world where the earth's resources are not concentrated in North America and Europe and Australia and New Zealand but, that at the, but, but in fact that the Earth's resources are much more equitably, to use a word that I don't really like, but for now I don't have another one, are much more equitably and just and justly distributed. And all of that, you know, once we begin to imagine it, then we begin to do the work to, to lay the foundation and to build the institutions that makes that possible. And that involves as well, educating ourselves to make that possible. You write early in, in your pamphlet about how aspects of Rastafarianism and its communal philosophy and, and anti-capitalist stance really helped influence a lot of your ideas about this. Can you tell me a little bit more about that and how it, it, in, it informs many of the ideas in On Property? Yeah, well, I think that, you know, I, I began by talking a little bit about the first abolition movement and of course, contemporary abolition, I would argue, is, is um, the continuation of that initial movement. But in between that initial movement and where we're at today, you know, there have been various points in time where different discrepant political, Black political formations and groups have entered into the public sphere to offer us a different account, a different narrative of what is possible. And Rastafarians are, are one such group. You know, Rastafarians' commitment to a notion of communal living, um, Rastafarians' commitment to um, a respect of other species and the earth's resources, um, Rastafarians' um, commitment to um, a collective sharing of the earth's resources are all instructive of 
another narration of what property might mean. That property doesn't have to be um, one accruing stuff to oneself, that it can be shared. And so these other accounts of property begin to open up a space for us to imagine how to live differently collectively together, because I think that that's ultimately what's at stake, how to live differently and collectively together. Right. I just want to interject just for a moment, Ronaldo, just to, to remind people that are that are tuning in right now that they can ask questions. Um, you can do it in the chat, uh, I believe in Zoom, or if you're on Facebook, you can do it that way. There are people monitoring. So there will be a chance for, for people to ask Ronaldo, I mean, um, uh, questions about on property and just his thoughts in, in, in general. He has many great ones, as, as I'm sure you can tell. Um, Ronaldo, this book essentially is about on property, but I look at it as about the three P's. So it's property, police, and prisons. Uh, you talk about defunding the police, an idea, a concept that I would say maybe two years ago seemed completely loopy, out of the park. No one would ever consider it. People wouldn't be writing articles about it. It wouldn't be discussed seriously to any extent. But now, people are starting to really de sort of dive deep into, into this topic. Tell me about why you believe police policing cannot be reformed and should be abolished and why you believe it can work. So I, I guess the first thing is to say that, you know, policing comes out of that dreadful history of transatlantic slavery and plantation slavery that we've been talking about earlier. And once we reckon with the fact that policing comes out of that dreadful history, um, it's really um, clear to us that policing cannot be reformed, um, that the functions of policing are particularly launched at two populations of people that are the trouble of policing itself. There's a reason why in North America, Black people and Indigenous people find themselves um, in the bulk of trouble with policing. And that has to do with the fact that policing has to maintain the ongoing theft and dispossession of Indigenous people from their lands. And that policing functioned initially and most importantly to curtail Black movement, meaning Black people running away from plantations, running away from slave, slave owners, and so on. And policing continues to drag along that history with it. Now, when we talk about abolishing the police, people are worried about conflict, but there are other ways to manage conflict. We don't actually need police to manage conflict. And much of what police manages as conflict is embedded again in this problem of property, of someone believing that something that they own, something that they have accrued to themselves has been transgressed. And so once we begin to deal with the problem of property, once we begin to deal with the question of communities of people being able to manage conflict themselves as they have done in the past and as many communities do right now, um, we begin to lay the foundation for a transformation of the world where policing is no longer necessary where policing is no longer the means through which we manage conflict. And in fact, we begin to um, accrue other ways of responding to conflict, um, being accountable to each other in communities. And this doesn't mean that bad things go away. It simply means that um, the bulk of the things that we think are bad, which are located, in, in, in property and individual ownership of property, those things definitely become resolved. Other kinds of, of difficult things that might happen, we can come up and we have come up with other ways of dealing with them and responding to them. And I talk about some of those in the book. I talk about how black feminists, um, despite um, being exposed to um, sexual assault have been leading in 
coming up with ways of being accountable in communities without involving the police around something as difficult as sexual assault. So we actually have the means, the mechanism, the thought, the imagination to deal with conflict in ways that do not require the police. The last thing I want to say about the police is, and this really is in many ways tied to the historic function of the police. The police are a violent force. And you can't actually deploy violence to stem violence. All it does is reproduce violence. So we, we have this idea that the police interrupts violence. But what the police actually, what policing actually does is that it extends violence, it creates violence. Um, and this is what we saw so clearly with George Floyd. You know, um, I, I, another thing that you talk about in the book is incarceration and and how in instances where even violent crimes have gone down and the building of jails and and and, and inc incarcerations have gone up. Uh, what are your your thoughts about prisons and, and and getting rid of them? Because I think a lot of people would be quite fearful of the idea that there aren't places for quote unquote bad people or people who do extreme harm. Well, you know. Prisons and caging people is a terrible way of dealing with conflict. Um, again, the prison, along with the police, is an extension of ongoing violence. It doesn't interrupt violence. Um, but one of the things that I point out in the book, um, drawing on the work of Ruth Wilson Gilmore and, and her study of the California prison system, and, and how the California prison system became a fundamental part of the California economy is that, you know, prisons, prisons occupy a very interesting and particular place in managing populations of wasted people, unwanted people, um, because they're not entirely not wanted. Um, they're also needed because in the realm of white supremacy. And one of the things I do, I, I, I turn to some of the stats um, for the US prison system, where you have stats where something like 80, 70 and 80% of incarcerated people are Latinx and black. And then something like 70% of the people who are working administration and managing them are white. What you see is the replication of the plantation model. So again, once we begin to look at the functions of these institutions and what they're creating, what they're circumscribing, what they're reproducing, we see a very particular log a set of logics being reproduced. And those logics are logics of violence. They continue to um, impact the very, the very people who had to be, if you will, made anathema to the founding logics of property itself, the theft of land that became property, um, the theft of resources from that land that became property, the way in which those resources are turned into something we call wealth, and how that wealth produces a particular kind of population, a population that we mark as white, and how that population then comes to see itself as an opposition to um, Black and Indigenous peoples, who it imagines now wants to take its wealth from, from it. And so, you know, we're really talking about, sorry if I'm going on too long, but we're really talking about, you know, a long process of having built a structure that claims to legitimate, and in most cases, um, legitimates particular kinds of practices. But then there are these pesky people called Black people and Indigenous people who keep popping up <laughs> and pointing to why that system is fundamentally uh, problematic, troubling, dangerous, and indeed to use the language back on itself and indeed criminal. <laughs> and, and so that's in part what, what I've been trying to articulate in the book in a number of different kinds of ways. And you do it quite well. I mean, considering this is a pamphlet that's about a hundred pages, uh, it's incredible the historical context that you that you provide to help illustrate what you're talking about and why 
some of these issues, these historical issues are just are carried on, you know, decade after decade after decade. I think you said uh, it's the, how plantation logic frames present day policing. And you just kind of you, you explain that, Ronaldo, you know, um, thank you so the, much. Yeah, you know, at, at the end, you know, you talk about a lot of big things that are very troublesome to some to some degree to digest, really. Um, but at the end of the pamphlet, I felt like you were quite hopeful and that you do see a better way possible. I, I want to talk to you a little bit about that. And, and I want you to tell me what gives you hope that things can change and that we've reached a point where these ideas are not out there, that they're, that they're based in reality and possibility. Yeah, well, look, I mean, if last year, 2020 in May, hundreds of thousands and not millions of people were taken to the street and saying, defund the police, that tells you that, you know, folks who've been working on various iterations of abolish the police and prison abolition since at least the 60s and the 70s, but heavily so in the mid to late 1990s and onward, that the ideas that they've been working on have taken root in a whole series of ways. And of course, we know that, you know, politics is struggle and that change is struggle and that that's a process. So as many people as we're saying, abolish the police, there were many others saying that's not possible, that's not realistic. And, and so that's a contest of ideas. And I think that what we're seeing um, at the micro level as communities deal with conflict and harm on their own without involving the police, as intellectuals, politicians begin to offer other solutions for not having to involve the police in our daily lives, that we're beginning to see people reimagine what it means to live better collectively together. And as we begin to do that work, the police becomes less and less an important site and forced to help organize our lives and to organize our social relations. So yes, I am hopeful. I'm also hopeful to the extent that what we've seen in at least the last decade or so, um, since at least 2014 and the re-energizing of the Black Lives Matter movement um, across North America and other parts of the world, is that we are seeing um, an attempt to offer and if you're seeing an attempt for people to be very clear that the world that we make is the world that we're able to narrate to each other. So if we want to make a world that cares about, in which we care about each other, we have to begin to narrate that and put that into practice. And so while I'm not someone who will fetishize young people as somehow being really in advance of everything um, that, that is politically possible, but we actually see young people in, in certain pockets doing this, living these ideas already, that there's nothing in on property that I've written about that is not already happening. It's just not happening at the scale that other things are happening, that the brutalities that we live with daily are happening. Um, but people are already living these moments and so the kind of question is, how do we scale them up? And of course, because this is in many ways um, a struggle over how we are going to distribute the Earth's resources, um, it's not going to happen overnight. Um, it's not going to be easy. But the thing about, you know, if you go back to where we began the conversation, the first abolitionist movement, um, you know, it was at least 300 years <laughs> of struggle to end transatlantic slavery and plantation slavery. So, you know, um, what, we, what our task today to do is to lay the foundation or continue laying the foundation towards something more hopeful, towards something more possible. Ronaldo, thank you so much. You know, we're getting questions in and I want to have enough time to get to all of them. So let's start diving in. And I just wanna remind people, I see the chat too. Let me, there's two. Okay, so there's a chat. Oh wow, there's a lot of there's a lot of questions in the chat, and hopefully uh, we'll get some of those in the uh, in here as well. 
So um, Amar Kai, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, and I apologize if I'm not asked, how does the concept and practice of mutual aid fit into this new abolition paradigm? Well, yeah, I mean, first, I, like I wanna say, I wanna really stress that abolition is not a new paradigm, that what we engage in is an unfinished project, um, an unfinished project to transform the world where black people and indigenous people could finally um, have autonomy over their bodies and their lives again. Um, and mutual aid and, and the practices of mutual aid um, in particular have um, long, a long history um, in black communities in the Americas um, where people who were shut out from, for lack of a better word, I'm gonna use mainstream access to resources, pool their resources to help each other. So mutual aid, the language of mutual aid has recently become, again, language that's popularized. But you know, everything from, um, you know, in, in Barbados, they call it sharing a hand, um, other places call it susu, all of these kinds of practices where people pool resources to help each other out, um, where people share across communities um, in terms of not just food, clothing, even um, schooling, all kinds of ways in which communities have been, um, another overnews word, um, made themselves resilient so that they can push back against the other forces that are shaping their lives has been fundamental to help people have survived. Um, and so mutual aid is just you know, a phrase that really marks a network of practices that people have used to survive and continue to use to survive, especially um, when state practices come down on them in ways that um, really threaten the continuation of people's lives and communities. It's a part that, of the larger abolitionist politics. Another question, Ronaldo, um, from Anonymous is, I wonder how you imagine engendering greater imagination in this project. Oh, it's actually Connie. Hi, Connie Holmes. Thank you so much. So I wonder how you imagine engendering greater imagination. Well, I think engendering a greater imagination begins with conversations like these. It begins with folks being willing to hear that how our lives are currently arranged and organized um, is not inherent and is not inevitable. And it begins with people being open to the possibility that we can actually be deliberative and, and be thoughtful about how to organize our lives differently. And we can begin to imagine what are the things that we would need to put in place so not that people just live adequate lives, so that people live more than adequate lives. Um, it begins with having an open mind to clearly and soberly assessing the resources that we have at hand and thinking critically and clearly about how we can redistribute those resources so that all of us can live more than adequate lives. And so it's, it's really about being open to, um, generally I would say it's being open to what we think we know, what we don't know, and, and being open to um, recognizing that we can come together in ways to shape to shape the present so that the future looks different. Because abolition is not, the abolition that I articulate, it's not something that is going to happen down there, down the road. It's about what we do now that will impact what happens after. Ronaldo, Anonymous asks, interesting connection between property and the impact on Black people and Black bodies. My question is, do you own your home? While your ideas are interesting to play with, I wonder what solutions you would suggest for doing away with the ownership of property. <laughs> I think this person might be a journalist. Well, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's okay. I, I think that most of us in North America don't own our homes. We have the fantasy of owning our homes but really and truthfully, the banks own our homes. So, so but you know, again, um, I think that, that's the, that, that that question betrays exactly the problem that I'm trying to get at in the book. 
the question of abolishing property is not about our individual desire for the particular things that we think are the goods of life. The idea of abolishing property is about making available all of the things that we think makes life good available to everyone. That's, so it's not that we need to take something away from you. It's a question of if you think that this is important for living the best possible life that the species can have, why are we not working to make that available to all? So it shifts the priority from accumulating to yourself to thinking about sharing what it is that you might already have with others. Yeah, you know, in the in the pamphlet, you talk about the concept of the commons, you know, and how it brings kind of a different moral and, and ethical order. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because that's not something that a lot of people are familiar with, that concept. Yeah, well, you know, the idea of the commons comes from European history. And, 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 and just in a nutshell, it's this idea that the lands and the resources of the lands were open to all and people took what they needed. But then of course, monarchies and elites arose and they encircled the commons and, and unequally distributed those resources. And the resources went up, creating smaller elites and so on. But I argue in the book that we need a renewed notion of the commons where the earth's resources are once again collectively owned by us, but not just the earth's resources, that all of the technological advances and inventions that um, we have created in the last 500 years compounded become a part of this renewed and reimagined commons. And, and that by so doing, we have to think about what it would mean to, act, to equally and equitably distribute these resources, making sure, reminding all the time that human beings are just one species among others on this earth. And so, you know, the kind of question of the commons is really about an ethic of sharing and caring. And ultimately, um, you know, some would argue that um, climate change, imminent climate change will either force us to reckon with this, or it would push us to the outer limits of the kind of individualism and devastating practices of that individualism um, that will simply um, destroy the earth. But so, so the commons and thinking about the commons, thinking about communal responsibility, ownership is central to a more hopeful future, I would argue. Uh, more questions coming in. Anonymous asks, while we are isolating and distancing to mostly save the economy, how can we best use this time to imagine better? Well, what are you doing, Ronaldo? You, know, <laughs> you should read, talk to, talk to others, um, engage our neighbors, um, figure out what it means. What are, what are the kinds of resources? I guess I'm gonna repeat myself, but what are the kinds of resources that people need to live lives that are more than adequate? Because I think that, you know, a lot of our responses often to um, what politicians like to call intractable social problems is to say something like, you know, well, at least everybody should have a house. At least everybody should have access to healthcare. At least everyone should have access to, to, to food. But that's not my argument. My argument goes further than that, which is to say everybody should have really, really decent housing. Everybody should have excellent healthcare. Everybody should have access to really good food. That offering people the bare minimum or adequate is not enough, that we need more than adequate and we actually have the resources to do that. So the argument is we need to sit with ourselves and really answer the question because you know we live with a set of ideals that we supposedly care about each other, but many of our cultural and social practices don't actually bear that out. So we have to sit 
with ourselves in this moment than if we're feeling that we're isolated. We should sit in this moment and ask ourselves, after this isolation, what are we going to do to bear out the claim that we actually live in a caring, sharing society? How can we make that manifest in ways um, that we don't have in the city of Toronto where I am, almost 10,000 people living on the streets, most of whom are black and indigenous, um, you know? So it's those kinds of things that we have to concern ourselves with. Another question from anonymous attendee. I wonder if you might say something about the myth of individuality and how it informs or doesn't what you're doing in on property? Do you gesture toward a social relationality or lateral care that might be radically different than the individuality we currently have or offer? I'm so sorry, I'm, I'm totally like reading this horribly. Um, this person obviously has a very big brain and uh, is, a, is a thinker like you, Ronaldo. So I'll just reread this one more time. I wonder if you might say something about the myth of individuality and how it informs or doesn't what you're doing in on property. Let's start there because it's kind of a two-parter and then we'll take the other half. Yeah, so definitely um, I'm writing against individuality and individualism and I'm writing against, even though it's not explicit, I'm writing against that kind of enlightenment capitalist orientation of life. In the book, what I do is I use the phrase how to live better collectively together. And that's my way of saying that individualism as we've come to understand it on the capitalism and in the philosophy of what it means to be quote the highest form of what it means to be human is a fundamental problem for how we can live better collectively together and so you know my intent is to provoke conversations that begin to have us think about collective and communal responsibility stewardship and distribution of the Earth's resources. Another question for Ronaldo: would you agree that injustices that people of African heritage continue to experience in North America is but a symptom of a faulty capitalistic system? Yes, <laughs> but it's not just that, because you know, the thing about, you know, one of the things that I, I do very early in the in the book is you know, I write about policing in, in not just North America, in France, in the UK. And I even mention the recent um, protests against the police in Nigeria, the SARS police, um, the SARS protests. And part of what, and I write about also the way in which policing replicates itself as a structure of the plantation in even countries like Barbados um, where, that are like, you know, 90 something percent black people. What I'm trying to get at is that policing as a structure and a function, um, wherever it finds itself, um, finds itself a significant and major antagonism for black people and for black life. So it's not just that what we see and witness on our cell phone cameras and so forth in North America, um, that's highlighted as a significant problem. Um, but what I'm saying is that we have created, we have imagined, I shouldn't say we, we have imagined and created a world in which black people and indigenous people have been made waste, have been made expendable. And policing is one aspect through which that waste and expendability happens, but it happens in other ways too. Um, you know, we could have used the example of black women dying in childbirth in North America, right? <laughs> as, as an example of how waste happens. We could use the example of how um, black kids are ejected out of public schools, even when they're sitting in the classroom still, as another way of how the society and the systems and the institutions that we have created that stem directly out of the plantation continue to render some life forms, some people, um, some aspects of the, some members of the species um, less than and not wanted. And so policing is just one of the most egregious aspects of it, but it's not the only aspect of it. 
Yeah, and I'm glad that you you mentioned Nigeria and SARS because I, I I also appreciated that you were just talking about even the Caribbean and 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 islands where, uh, you know, there are these sort of enclaves where black people within their own country are not allowed. Uh, and I think you quoted Derek Walcott about like plantations by the sea, which I thought yeah. was just incredibly fascinating about how the, these the, these sort of these ills and these ways of these North American sort of structures are are there too, right? And you would think that there'd be more freedom in in a place where you're surrounded by black people. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think one of the things that I that I I I say it in passing in the book, but you know, Barbados, the small island where I was born, um, is where some historians argue that you know the first kind of instances of what comes to constitute modern policing happen. And from Barbados, those practices went to the Carolinas in what is now the US and then built up from there. You know, there's a story in the fact that, you know, Barbados was um, Britain's first um, settled colony in the Americas. And so that little island has produced a series of practices that have been replicated around the Americas. But also, if you, if you think about that place, and if you've ever been in that place, you can also feel the heaviness of that history in terms of how people comport themselves and so on. So these, these, these questions of how um, European colonization and expansion has shaped a number of geographies are not just about North America, right? In Nigeria, um, the protests around SARS, around the SARS force, it was pointed out that these Nigerian police were trained in the UK. <laughs> um, you know, so these these relationships continue to extend and cross in all kinds of interesting ways, right? So if you you can, you know, Harsha Harsha Walia in her new book Borders writes about how um, she writes about how Europe and places like Australia have now developed ways of moving the border to the extent that you don't have to reach Europe because people can be now policed in Nigeria. They can now be policed in North Africa. So you don't have, they don't have to get to Europe to be policed, right? You can push the border in that way, but it's the logic of it. It's the, it's the whole idea of how we have organized what it means um, to police people that has been spread around the world um, to significant um, detriment of, of our lives. Another writer writes, the kibbutz experience in Israel and the commune experience throughout the US, Canada and elsewhere in the 1960s are good examples of living together communally without owning property. These still exist today. Maybe these living arrangements just need to be better advertised and grown. They are feasible and empowering of the spirit of cooperation and brotherhood so needed in our world. What are your thoughts, Ronaldo, on that? Um, the argument that I'm making is really quite different from that. Um, that those remained forms of colonization at, at the micro level. Um, so I'm not interested in replicating um, a particular kind of refusal that still holds intact um, the overarching frame of how we've been forced to live um, presently. Those forms of communal living continue to hold in place the current arrangements that we have. I'm talking about um, a process in which we begin to fully reimagine the order of how human life and the human species proceeds. Um, so this is indeed a long process. Um, it's a process of reimagining even, even what we mean by the word human. What does it mean to be a part of the species? It might be that we even have to name ourselves differently. That the word human might be too tainted, too overburdened with um, all kinds of problems to be rescued as a way to name a market species. But what I'm saying is that these, those, those are enclaves within 
a structure that is replicating and reproducing violence. And those enclaves are not sufficient, but those enclaves also replicate the very problems of the coloniality that the argument I'm trying to make um, is pushing against in the most forceful way. Thank you, Ronaldo. We have just a couple more questions now before we wrap up. Christine from Ottawa asks, would you agree that higher taxes would be needed uh, to be imposed on uh, citizens if we are to fund the basic human right of shelter for everyone? Well, I would agree that higher taxes would be a very tiny part of beginning to build a foundation for transformation. I would go further and say that, you know, we shouldn't have billionaires. We shouldn't have multimillionaires. You know, we shouldn't have um, wealth concentrated in the hands of small numbers of people. Um, so this is a challenge to how we understand what are the priorities of, of how we live, to, live better together. And of course, you know, questions of taxes at that level um, are only, you know, if we can reorient ourselves um, through logics like taxes, um, where um, it is no longer acceptable for someone to, to have $133 billion, whatever that actually means, um, where it's no longer acceptable um, that someone should be without shelter, um, then we do something different about how we think about what kinds of institutions we need to build to make sure that that doesn't happen. And so that's really the force of the argument. Yes. So those small things, those incremental things can begin to lay some of the bricks of a new foundation that we, that we can move towards. Great, we have one last question before we wrap up. It's from Kaylin Bradley. In a past essay that I have read of yours, Queer Returns, you discuss how the HIV AIDS pandemic becomes the event by which queer rights are determined. Could you talk a little bit about the catastrophe of the COVID pandemic and how that has been cast as an equalizer, even as we have seen a rise in violence against Blacks around the world, and how it might become an event to reconceptualize property and the commons and Black people's relationship to property, uh, other than as depreciated commodities that are simultaneously a threat with a viral potential to, to depreciate property. So it's a very, very long question. Do you want me to repeat that? Yeah. Maybe just No, I think I I think I can handle it. Good. Perfect. So so I think there are a couple of things there that are really important to notice. One I would say is that, you know, um HIV remains an epidemic for black people wherever they are in the world. So, you know, in parts of Canada, the US, um, uh, Western Europe, um, white people are talking about the end game of HIV, they, it's just a, a chronic manageable, manageable illness. But anywhere in the world where there are large groups of Black people, HIV remains an epidemic, which means that Black people are living in an epidemic of HIV and a pandemic of COVID. And in both instances, um, Black people are paying the price for that um, with death. Um, and so, you know, one of the things I've been thinking a lot about is that um, it is quite likely that when people have been vaccinated for COVID, that COVID will continue to live on in our communities much longer than in other communities. And if HIV is the model that we look at, that seems pretty certain um, to be the case. The other thing that I, I would say is that, you know, um, we know in places like Canada, the UK, we know who's dying from COVID. We know it's Black and Indigenous and other people of color. And so again, um, that raises an interesting kind of similarity. But I, but at the same time, I'm, earlier, Ithil, you had asked me about mutual aid. At the same time, these very instances of dreadfulness that Black people are asked to live with become the source through which Black people make community. And by that, I mean political community. I don't only mean community based on our skin color and how we look, because sometimes there are forces within community formations that are not, um, if you will, 
um, interested in, in our survivance, but I'm talking about the making of political community. And it's in the making of political community that we continue to push towards um, a different kind of world, a different shape of the world, a different imagining of the world. And the last thing I would say to that is, one of the reasons that I, I, I keep mentioning and talking about Black feminists is because I think that, you know, at least since the 1960s, Black feminists have been some of the most cogent and articulate and nuanced thinkers around what it means to have a critique of the state and what it means to imagine what, what a different kind of community formation might like, look like. And part of that has to do with Black women also being the brunt of this lack of ownership of your body, um, not just ownership of your kin and your children, but you know, either um, ownership of your body in a, in a range of different kinds of ways. And so um, I know that there's this kind of rhetoric now about believe Black women, and that's not the argument that I'm making, but what I would say is pay really close attention to Black women organizing in their communities because it's that kind of organizing in that Black women do in their communities that really points to the nature of political community and what is possible. And we will stop and end it right there. Ronaldo Walcott, thank you so much for taking the time to discuss your pamphlet on property. Thank you for having me. And I also just want to thank everyone who tuned in today and wrote very, very thoughtful uh, questions uh, for Ronaldo. I would highly recommend that you um, get the pamphlet. It is a very, very fascinating read. And uh, again, thank you so much, Ronaldo, for your time. Thank you.